we are. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to spend a little time today, maybe 40 minutes or so, on um, the aspect of morality and ethics in medicine. Mm -hmm. And this is um, uh, more related to Western medicine, but I think it has a universal appeal. And uh, what I thought of doing uh, was basically doing a, uh, a study um, and, uh, and then discussing it. Uh, the, um, as you know, in, in neurology and in general medicine, there are new research and very exciting new research in almost all aspects of neurology and actually all aspects of medicine in embryonic stem cell research. How many of you are familiar? Yeah, so we're all kind of familiar with embryonic stem cell. So I, I decided to uh, bring this to your attention, to talk about medicine and morals. Since we are dealing with patients all our lives, I think it's very important that we have a certain level of ethics and morality to help us to do the right thing. I call it the right thing, whatever it is. Um, recently, um, a judge, and I'll just read this, this is uh, data information, uh, halted uh, federally funded research of human embryonic stem cells, which had been approved on the guidance issued by the previous uh, president. This is uh, Obama, President Obama. The Justice, the Justice Department said it is reviewing the judge's ruling. So they halted it. There's been a great uh, movement I see in, in neurology specifically in uh, working with embryonic uh, cells, stem cells in multiple sclerosis, for example, spinal cord injury in patients who become paraplegic, quadriplegic, injecting stem cells, et cetera, et cetera. And we even have some companies in the Washington area that are doing the stem cell, uh, stem cell work. At the heart of the legal battle is a law known as the Dickey-Wicker Amendment. There's a name to it, the Dickey-Wicker Amendment, which prohibits federally funded research in which a human embryo is destroyed, discarded, or knowingly subject to risk of injury or death greater than that allowed under applicable regulations. So the measure has been attached to every appropriations for the Department of Health and Human Services since, 19, since 1996. So this has been around uh, and the, it goes back and forth in the United States. Should we do stem, stem cell research? I know it's being done. And in fact, even in the vaccine issues that we recently had, they were using uh, some stem cell. Uh, and that, that was a, one of the explanations for some people who didn't get the vaccine or didn't get the jabs. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there, there was a uh, the department oversees the federal government's primary health research, NIH. The plaintiffs were argued working with embryonic stem cells by nature depends upon the destruction. So it's a destruction of an embryo and the new guidelines therefore violated the law. President George W. Bush banned federal funding of embryonic stem cell research in 2001, citing quote, moral concerns raised by the new frontier of human embryonic stem cell research. Even the most noble ends don't justify the means. So uh, this whole issue of having to destroy embryos in order to get something positive. President Obama, when he came into office, he reversed the policy by executive order. Do, do you know what that means? What's an executive order? It doesn't, it doesn't have to go through Congress. Exactly, it doesn't have to go through Congress. It does, doesn't have to be voted on. It doesn't represent the people really. It's just one person's view. And he said the executive order in 2009 
saying federal agencies may support and conduct responsible, scientifically worthy human stem cell research, including human embryonic stem cell to the extent permitted by law. In recent years, when it comes to stem cell research, rather than furthering discovery, our government has forced what I believe is a false choice between sound science and moral values. In this case, I believe the two are not inconsistent. So, so this has been going on. So let, let's try to analyze it. Let's go around and see what, what, what do you think, Imran, about the about use? The em embryonic stem yeah. cells. Yeah. yeah, it can be like, uh, there are two aspects. It can be like uh, good for many autoimmune diseases and neurodegenerative conditions and not just neurology, like in all part because like uh, all of our cells are dying day by day and mm -hmm. with embryonic stem cell, yeah, it can be prevented. Yeah, but I I think that it needs to be like detected uh, and like it, it needs to be like uh, restricted and people should watch and observe this and maybe governments can send people and okay. so it cannot be like specialized and some companies like it cannot be uh, that's what's happening now we yeah. I, uh, there should I, be restrictions uh, by the government I think I have been approached by some companies to uh, refer patients for Parkinson's disease uh, they are doing uh, embryonic so called embryonic Cells, uh, injecting them uh, non-specifically. I, I don't like that very much. I would like to see more science, more control over this. Yeah. How is it done, yeah. etc. Yeah. But what I agree with you. Also, what about the rest who, of you? Who can also World Health Organization? And who should uh, you know? Uh, yeah. So I, I had mixed feelings about this particular company that, because you know when our patients are very sick. They're desperate. They're mm -hmm. willing to try anything. Our multiple sclerosis patients, spinal cord patients, uh, Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer patients. They're willing to try everything. Um, anybody, uh, Dr. Stein, what do you think? Um, I think the life of the mother is more important than the life of the, of the embryo. I think if the embryo can help life as it is, we should use the embryo for that. I, I, it's complicated. I don't think the embryo is sacrosanct, at least early on. Okay. Um, some people feel that once you have an embryo, yeah, it's it's equal to a human being. It's equal it's to like a human being. What do the rest of you think? It is a complicated problem. So many religions think that, for example, when when does a soul get into an embryo? When the what do you define as a human or how would you define human, right? But in a very specific way, you know, as you, as you said, does the end justify the means? That's right. And I think that as Emery said, doing research in this, in this area can be fruitful, yeah. especially for people with Parkinson's, with that late Parkinson's, Alzheimer, right. etc. But I think that having that control over corporations, you know, having the research done in an open manner and open discussion of sorts, okay. instead of just letting them fund their own research, having that government control, and not only government control, but having that. Um, knowledge open to the public instead of having of letting corporations decide by themselves i think that should be the best thing because if you let corporations decide by themselves they can do whatever they want yeah, they can have and them. you have yeah and you have no say in what they will do or will not do so i think rather than just being a corporation or an individual it is a matter of a society that should do or not, or should decide on how and when to implement these new technologies. Excellent. Because yeah. more we involve the public, like more the information will be given to the public and that could raise awareness in the public, rather than just one body controlling the research and everything. So that would be a problem. 
for example, like NIH is in, like main responsible for the research and all. So if all the information is kept towards them only, like if they are only having all the information, so that would be a problem. Like it should be raised towards the public and great awareness about how. You think it should be more open, more more yeah. discussions. Yeah, right. More awareness regarding the. Yeah. Have you had any experience, any of you, in this yeah. embryonic uh, research and uh, just? Um, you know, this is what we're talking about, no, no personal experience. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lee, yeah. yeah. And I think if the cell is from the periphery, like a, a fibroblast, and they program and go to some specific yes. uh, uh, neuron tab, such as propaminergic uh, neurons, and then just to use the patient cell or some healthy cell and re reprogram and to very specific one, I think that's acceptable. In other words, the patient, the, the sick patient themselves. Yeah. By some, uh, some uh, um, for example, PD patients, they may uh, show abnormal in the uh, fibroblast cell. So it depends. You, you cannot yeah. use yeah. the fibroblast from these patients, maybe not yeah. healthy patients. You know, yeah. there's the difference between poor personal morality in public morality, where a bunch of men, not women, decide what is moral. So that if it was personal and your mother was dying and there was a possibility that a, 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 a substance derived from a human embryo would help her, in your personal morality, would you hold the embryo higher than the mother? Personally, not the whole world, just between you and your mother and your mind. So I, I do want to say something. So I think when analyzing these problems, we have to see all the scope of them. So there is some things to take in consideration. So first of all, of course, we all have personal beliefs, but also as doctors, I think we should tell our patients uh, all their options, even if it goes against our beliefs. Maybe to say, you know, I wouldn't do it because my beliefs don't allow me, but they are doing this. So to inform the patients about uh, all the possibilities that are there. And about like the politics part of it, uh, it's going to be very hard. And it also depends on, you know, if the country uh, has a religious view as a country, like if all the constitution and everything is written out of a religion. So if it's a non-religious state, uh, yeah, decisions shouldn't be made because of religion. But if the country is, it's going to be more complicated. So I think the state, if it's a religious state, has the total right of saying, I am not funding this. But as a public health measure, I do think they have to take in consideration, not out of the moral beliefs, but what is going to be better for the population. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Well, then this is something that you're all going to face. Um, time is coming very quickly where these kinds of decisions uh, you will be involved with. And uh, stem cell research is everywhere now. Mm -hmm. As I said, I, I was contacted uh, recently by uh, a businessman, a business uh, that are getting stem cells from individuals and then implanting them into people and claiming a uh, remarkable improvement in Parkinson's disease, for example. Well, I, I just wonder about this. I I, uh, I don't see the science, you know. Like without letting them know, like the proper research and all, it's, it's, it's not ethical, I think. Well, so it's not ethical. Well, there are people who are re very rich and they're paying thousands of dollars, hundred thousand dollars to get, uh, injections of stem cells because they're hopeless like it's an open and there's a hopeless, yeah i i think it all also depends on who controls the narrative as as a way so if you know with nih who controls the decisions and who controls where the research will go i think that also depends because as you said if you get approached by a businessman what are his objectives with the research? Is it just to gain money? Is it just to grow the company? Or is it to actually further the, you know, it's 
like a cynical way to to see it but what what are the objectives and how can they maybe mark up the data because yeah. yeah and people can absolutely mark up the data you can do a lot of things with statistical data to show a benefit even if there is none or vice versa I remember that this is so complex because even at the nih and i i was at nih for a couple of years um we can be misled thinking mm -hmm. that, well, it's the NIH and it's 100%, uh, it's very thorough and it's scientific and this and that. Well, that's not true. We just had the experience the last few years with Wuhan uh, again, China, where the uh, in the United States, it was illegal to do um, research on, on this particular virus, the SARS, CoV-2, et cetera. And so they went outside of the United States to invest. And that was the NIH, Anthony Fauci. And so just because we trust and we believe in an institution, mm -hmm. we still, I think, have to be very careful. I, I remember reading about this years ago, 10, 15 years ago, before we had the pandemic. And I said, you know, I just don't like this. That, uh, the president at the time, I don't remember who the president was, president, well, it's illegal to do this kind of research because, because uh, there's gain of function. It's really gain of function research and anything can happen. And being a, a doctor and a scientist, et cetera, I recognize that there's risk. So they, they went ahead and they went to China. Mm -hmm. So here we trust the NIH, right? We trust the people, we trust Anthony Fauci. And we, but there, you have to be very careful when you trust even these quote experts and people uh, who virologists, et cetera, et cetera. They may have ulterior motives that are not uh, evident immediately. Yeah. And you always say, well, what kind of interior motive? Well, follow the money. Uh, Anthony Fauci is the highest paid public servant in the United States, uh, millions of dollars. Uh, number two, uh, he's at uh, he he has the uh, the strength and the recognition to give out millions of dollars for research. Right? Imagine that you have a laboratory and you would like to get some of those millions of dollars. You're going to agree with him. You're going to say, "Oh yes, 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 yes." Yeah. So there's all kinds of questions. There's all kinds of moral and ethical issues in medicine. It's a tough, tough, I don't have the right answer, but I think it comes down to individuals. When, if I have a choice personally of uh, trusting one individual versus trusting a government or trusting uh, some kind of institution, sometimes I will go with the individual. <laughs> but again, not always, because you have people who are just kind of business-minded and, you know, so it's, it's a very tough, uh, tough choice. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stein, any, any other input? Yeah. I know many people who are fully against abortion until someone in their family has needs an abortion and they'll fly any place. I mean, I think there's a two-faced issue. There's a philosophical issue about how ideally things should be. And there's a practical issue when it comes down to you and your family and your loved ones. Uh, and we go back and forth. For example, why should only men make the decision of how women deal with their bodies? That's real, that's outrageous. Why don't women get together and decide how to deal with their bodies? I'm not a woman, how can I tell a woman how to do that? I just think a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of hypocrisies go on in this country. Uh, and that's a, it's probably always gonna be that way, but it's outrageous to me that men decide what women will do and they do it under, under the guise of morality. I think they're full of baloney, really. I just think uh, that's uh, As you know, uh, we just recently had yeah, yes. the Supreme Court yeah. uh, issue. How many of you understand what actually happened? Any of you, what is your understanding? 
It was mostly political related. Well, no, but I mean, what what exactly like, what happened with this, this so, decision? From what I understand, there was a, a political trial, right? I I don't know the no, names of the. It was Supreme Court. Yeah, but there was. And it came up, uh, you know, this Roe versus Wade came up about abortion, right? Yeah. yeah but so, what do you think happened? I mean, what is your understanding? Because there's a lot of politicking yeah. and I think a lot of uh, misconceptions the what, what do you think happened from what I understand Roe v Wade is the the trial the trial that made abortion legal in the United States okay and what happened is that it wasn't on the Constitution and it isn't a part of the of it's a trial that people can that that uh, lawyers can use as a way to Say that abortion is legal in the United States, right? But they, but the justice system reversed that decision. So now right. abortion is not, no longer legal. But no. that does mean actually the only thing that happened. See, there's there's so much misinterpretation of mm -hmm. this. The only thing that happened is they said, "Why should these men in black?" And he's right, Dr. Stein is right. These men in black make a decision. Mm -hmm about women and you know people and so forth let's push this back to the individual states there are mm -hmm. 50 states and let the decision be made at the state level which to me is so logical because at the state level you have to vote it has to do with voting and mm -hmm. if a state any state mm -hmm. decides that they are for abortion they can say it if they say they're against abortion against it's the majority it's the majority of people I think that's the fairest way. Yeah. It, yeah. Remember that this decision by the Supreme Court did not alter the possibility of you having an abortion. In one state, you can have one. The state next to you not have one. So basically, you just move for a couple of miles and you have an abortion. So abortions are still legal in the United States. Mm -hmm. The only thing that has happened is that instead of the men in black, all these men who were in the Supreme mm -hmm. Court making a decision, it's thrown back into the state's hands mm -hmm. where you but can vote. Look, look can, at the comment about that about 13% of the voters vote, really. Very small amount of the population actually decides this. And I would, I would also like to say something about it. So Ecuador is a country that has never had legal abortions. So it's forbidden here, it's penalized and you go to jail. So, uh, yeah, it's it has been like that forever, even if Ecuador is considered a non-religious country. So the problem is that even if it's going to be legal in some states, the poor people are maybe not going to be able to access to it. So, for example, what happens here is that uh, mostly poor people go get unsafe abortions and they die because of it. So many of our maternal deaths are because of unsafe abortions, but it's undercovered because they don't talk about it. So yeah. I think it will bring a public health issue, a big public health issue, because the people who don't have access to health are going to be the most affected, and then it's going to cost the government a lot of money as well. Okay. So okay. Okay. It's, it's a problem. Yeah, well, there. thank you for that. Thank you for your input. Um, I, it, it's a complicated problem, and I think that um, we all have to face it individually as doctors. Um, I'll just share, and we'll end this discussion, but I'll share one, one experience I had over here at one of the big hospitals, uh, Fairfax, the Innova Fairfax mm -hmm. Hospital, a big hospital, yeah. where I was on call, and I had to see the patient, and I went to the um, emergency room, and then I went to the ICU. The patient had a stroke. He was hemiplegic, but awake. He was following commands mm -hmm. and uh, probably had good prognosis. The family were there. There was a son, there was a daughter, there was a wife. And they had me in the waiting room and I was sitting with them in the room. And the son who seemed, wanted to make all the decisions, the son seemed to be the decision maker. He said to me, doctor, in, in a very loud voice. And this was just uh, hours since he came into the ICU. Yeah. Can you guarantee, this is what he said to me, can you guarantee that my father will be normal? 
And I said, I listened to that. It's kind of an odd, odd remark. But again, this was a family. Um, it's immaterial what religion they were. I, I knew their religious preference, but that it's immaterial. And uh, I said, well, uh, I said, it's early. I mean, I just finishing examining your father. He had a stroke. Most often patients will show recovery, some recovery. Yeah. And then he kept saying to me, can you guarantee that my father will be perfect? I said, well, I, you know, and I, I was very gentle and I was, I said, I, there's no guarantee, but generally patients with this kind of stroke, I think it was a bit of cerebral embolus or something. And generally they do make some recovery. He'll be in physical therapy. And I, I showed them a story uh, and what will happen and so forth. And then it's like the family just turned and they said, well, in that case, pull the plug. I said, wait a minute, he just came in, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. and right away, uh, it, this was against my, I would say, moral, ethical, and also religious views, even though they were of the same religion as I was, very interesting. And I, 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 I you know, I started to, to speak again and so forth and so forth. And I recognized right away that this, this is not going to work. Yeah. We're going to have conflicts. Mm -hmm. So what I said, okay, I said, okay, I went over to the main station, the nurse's station, and I said, I'm, I'm giving up this case. I would like another neurologist to, to see this patient. But that was a decision that I made. I felt that I... I was not able to, even after describing and discussing, and I said to myself, I said, you, you're going to have problems. You, you, we will have problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot guarantee that the person will be back to normal. Yeah. And, it, and these people insisted that if my father is not going to be normal, then he doesn't want to live and therefore pull the plug. And I refused to do that. So I walked away. In a nice way, in a, in a professional way, I handed it over to another neurologist. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened subsequently, but mm -hmm. that's what I did. So sometimes I think you have to, you have to say that you, you're not the appropriate person for this situation. What do you think, Dr. Stein? How would you have handled it? I think you did it completely correctly. I'll share with it's, you a possible mistake I made. I had a patient in mid 40s or 50s she had a 16-year-old daughter who was living downstairs in their basement with a boy of another uh, another race uh, as a husband, essentially husband and wife. Crazy. The girl got pregnant, and I advised the mother to get an abortion. I said, take her by the hand, take her down to the abortion office, and say, look, I think you should have an abortion. They said, no way, no how. They're going to angry at me. So a year later, she comes in complaining. I have to take care of the baby, crying all the time. No one helps me complaining, complaining, complaining about the baby that she has to manage. You know, it goes both ways. Uh, it's always very hard when you have a young patient, you see a life ahead, college, a job, and so forth, and see so your pregnancy, and you say, what should you do? Um, I've had two patients like that, and in both cases, they went through the pregnancy. I don't know what happened afterwards, but my moral position, again, is I'm in favor of the young woman having a life. If pregnancy gets in the way, it's terribly moral and complicated, but my, my vote is an abortion so she can live on. She is, that's just my practical point of view. They did disagree with me, they were angry at me, and then two years later they said, oh my God, we should have followed your direction. But it's very sticky, as Dr. Manad says, you're really treading on very, very complex territory. That's a great yeah. The issue of the abortion is a little different from mm -hmm. trying to take care of a patient and the mm -hmm. family uh, having a different opinion and expectations. Uh, the issue with abortion uh, was that it's not just one life you're dealing with, the mother's life, but it's you're also dealing lives. it's two lives. And who is talking for the baby? Who, who represents the baby? And... Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I recognize it. Uh, there's no right answer. There are situations where, of course, you have to abortion like medical condition. Exactly. There's a medical condition, anencephaly, for example, or. But you know, I 
at one point when I was younger in medicine, I said, well, what if the person has trisomy? You know, it's a trisomy. In the war uh, 1930s in Germany, just before World War II, the Germans had this notion that these were impure people. Mm -hmm. the, all of the trisomy people were, were killed and they were aborted or killed. Patients with Alzheimer's disease, with the dementia, they were killed. 500,000 people were actually murdered in Germany before 1939, so as the Nazis got into power. And their notion of theoretical was that they're Aryan and they're pure. You know, the, the German people were pure yeah. and they didn't want these bad genes, you know, like a trisomy, et cetera. So as I've gotten older in, in medicine, I've taken care of a lot of the Down syndrome patients, for example. I find them to be wonderful. I mean, I, I warm, I don't know if you, we haven't yeah. seen anybody here, but You're extremely warm, warm yeah. extremely loving, caring. caring. And not only that, but some of the patients with Down syndrome uh, have written books. Uh, my son, who is a movie producer, hired a patient with Down syndrome to play a Down syndrome person in the movie. And he was excellent. He was, a, he was an actor. And he did a beautiful job. So the thing is that I am, uh, I've also changed some of my views because of experience. And I think that's that becomes important too. Um, when I was a young man in uh, medicine and in internship uh, residency early early years, uh, yes, I, I was for abortion. Um, as I gotten older and more experienced and sensitive, my my views have changed. So, except for life of the mother, uh, rape. Uh, a, a medical illness, etc. Um, I think that we have to consider that there are two people. There's the baby, the infant, and there's also the mother. And as you know, in America, there's a lot of discussion now. There's a lot of controversy because some people actually believe in abortion until delivery. And actually, it's questionable, but the previous governor in the, here in Virginia, who was a pediatric uh, a neurologist, ped pediatrician, mm -hmm. can you imagine? Also said that even after delivery of the fetus, so you have a baby, you then have to have a discussion with, with the parents whether you're going to kill this baby. Oh, to me, that's that's infanticide. Yeah, that, that's that's infanticide. Yeah, that's, that's, what do you think? That's murder. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. That, we, had a, we actually had a doctor, a, pedi a pediatrician, a pediatric yes, neurologist, yes, the, the, the previous governor uh, said that it's a discussion. It's a discussion by the parents. Yeah, technically, because two weeks ago and two weeks later, uh, one, the baby was not born and the baby was born two weeks later. I, I think technically uh, the things are like the same. But yeah, uh, killing the infant like two weeks ago or killing the infant. But, but after. I think yeah. the, the most important thing is when somebody has you know a a pregnancy that you conceive in a lab test, but it's been a few weeks. There's no emotional connection with the baby yeah. versus nine months yeah. versus giving birth to the baby. So I think that that emotional connection that that physical bond with the baby, yes. it changes, yes. It, it changes a lot of things and... Well, I think that uh, kind of a, as a final point, that we all as individual doctors, we, we have to make the decision for ourselves whether you want to participate. Yeah. And if you can't, then you have to be a professional about it and say, this is against uh, my, my wishes, my desires, my humanity. But you can find an, you know, you'll find another doctor that that will that will agree with. Because I don't think I don't think that you should uh, do something that you don't wish to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, in World War II, the Germans, unfortunately, German doctors, German doctors were all involved in in murder and killing. Yep. Yep. And the way the way they justified it, which is interesting. There was unemployment. 
many doctors, young doctors, didn't have a job. So they 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 basically did things I'm sure they didn't want to do. And it, and it it hurts me whenever I read about this or I see it, uh, the Nuremberg trials, etc. Fellow doctors, fellow physicians, would go ahead and 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 murder people. I I know that they didn't want to do it. That uh, they there were. There was a story about a doctor that had to sterilize. Uh, oh, of was... course, Dr. Mengele uh, was was yeah. a prime example. Uh, he was a brilliant German doctor who specifically specialized in twins. Uh -huh. So when he was the doctor in Auschwitz, so when the when the trains came, uh, he had all his colleagues and everybody looking for twins. And if you were a twin, they would be selected and they would be experimented on. Yeah. And the same thing happened in, uh, in other camps as well, where uh, special experiments were done. I, thank you. I, I'm not crying, uh, I'm allergic. Or yeah. pseudobulbar effect. Do you mind? Or do you have pseudobulbar I may have pseudobulbar effect. <laughs> it looks like I'm crying, but I'm actually allergic. Although the, this discussion is worthy of crying. Uh, the um, Ravensbrook is a story that um, maybe you will hear about later because I, I, uh, I got the, uh, my, my grandmother, my grandmother was at, in Ravensbrook with her two daughters, two aunts, and uh, she survived and she wrote a diary. And uh, it's a long story, but uh, they gave me the diary. The family gave me the diary to do something about it. I translated it. And uh, now my son's, you know, my son is a movie producer. Is it, thank you. He's very interested in they're writing a screenplay. So there may be a story, but but she survived uh, Ravensburg. Ravensburg was a camp for women. It was specifically built for women, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did the experiments on these these women, unfortunately, and uh, killed so many. I went, the family, I took the whole family. We went to visit Ravensbrück. It's so beautiful. You know, you go there with a car. I, it's about 50 miles east of Berlin. And it's so beautiful. Trees, green. There's a lake. They used to throw the remains into the lake. And, you know, they, they basically cremated the people. Uh, and And... Man's inhumanity, man. And as doctors, I just urge you, don't do things that you don't want to do, mm -hmm. even if if it depends on getting a job. Yes. Uh, our fellow doctors in Germany, I, I'm sure they didn't want to do it, but they all joined in. They looked the other way. They murdered the these patients with Alzheimer's, with dementia. They murdered the Down syndrome kids. And they murdered uh, people that they didn't think would help. And these were Germans, not Jews, not uh, anyone initially, else. Initially, usually two doctors had to sign a slip that they thought the patient uh, should be killed. Two doctors. Okay? Not just, it, a lot of this was on my doctors. The entire final solution to killing people started in America, believe it or not, uh, and then was transferred to Germany. I can give you information. But the most important part is most all of this was done by the medical profession. And that's why there's a, a organization called Medicine After the Holocaust. It really talks about the doctor's role in, the, in these killings. I will send you the information. It's rather fascinating. Uh, the very, very famous people on this group, Eric Candell and so forth, but it's mostly under doctors. Doctors selected, doctors had assistance, but it was medical. Medical people did this. In, in Germany, what in the 1930s, every city, every city had uh, regional groups. That was usually a social worker. There was a, a nurse, and there was doctors. One or two doctors that had to sign off on 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 these German people, and they were all killed. Uh, so, patients with mental retardation, the Down syndrome, of course, the Alzheimer patients, the demented people, the people we see here, they were all killed, murdered, 500, at least 500,000. 
I think that problem also started when eugenicia was plan like planted by Darwin's cousin. So they would talk about how to make a population better. And then they started doing all these studies and it just got really worse during the, the world. Right, right. My, point is, my point is that you should all make up your own minds. Don't be influenced by, by peer pressure just because your colleague is doing it. Uh, you have to face it. Mm -hmm. And you say to yourself, uh, my colleague may do it. I don't want to do it. So uh, you, you, you should make up your minds and don't be influenced even if a doctor is famous like a Anthony Fauci or somebody really famous and you go along with it don't go along with it question everything yeah. Yeah. in the 1960s when I was a teenager we said we had to, we had a saying you have to question everyone and don't trust anybody who's over what was it 35 well we, yeah, yeah. we said to uh, we said we don't trust anybody over 35 or 40. <laughs> and it was questioning, everything questioning. So all of you have to question everything. Yeah. And uh, trust uh, in yourself, trust in your own moral guidance to make decisions. All right. Is this useful, this kind of? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's useful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think th this is important. Uh, and th I have a book here. This is called Medicine and Morality. So, um, and uh, it's learning. And remember, we, we, we hired uh, a rabbi to come in and uh, we'll start probably next month, so you'll miss him. But in the meantime, we will cover a few points. And it's really, it, it, it's not so much uh, religious, but uh, I, think, I think it's uh, understanding, learning, uh, morality is it's quite important. Because remember that you'll have a lot of power. Wherever you go back to, you'll be in a position of power to help or to kill. All right, let's go. Let's Thank, see you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.